Well, I'm really honored, uh, uh, both in the kind words uh, from Kim, but also to be here with you. Uh, I've never addressed this board before, and uh, I'm, I was pleased to get the invitation and glad that the schedules work out to where I could be here. Uh, I'll give you a warning. I'm an economist. Uh, I look at the world from those lens, and uh, sometimes it will look a little different than what you're used to. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you invited me, and I'm here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about a little bit different topic than what is uh, on your agenda. Your agenda says that I'm going to explain the national model uh, for the denomination. Trust me, you don't want to hear much about that. Uh, that gets into great detail. Uh, it might even bore economists. It certainly would bore you. I will talk about it in general, uh, about some of its uh, major components and what we're doing with it, but the, the major topic here is trying to build a story uh, to where I think we all can understand that there will be, if, there, if not already, a shortage of elders in our denomination, uh, and that shortage is going to grow. Uh, and that puts uh, it more of, a, of an alert, an alarm for all of us, uh, because in the projections that we've made, uh, we haven't taken into account the consequences of such a shortage. Uh, so we're hoping and praying that that shortage will be attended to uh, and that we'll travel along the way without a shortage. Uh, but that's basically where we're going to go as far as the bottom line. I want to start with some perspectives. Uh, I'm going to talk about the decline of the United Methodist Church in the United States. I'm going to talk about the fact that we believe the decline is reversible and we have a strategy to address that. And we believe with that strategy, along with other components uh, of work around the denomination, we in fact can begin growth in the, United, in the United Methodist Church in the United States. We'll talk about the national projections out to 2030. That's coming from the national model. We'll talk about the elder shortage. Uh, and now in conclusion, <laughs> uh, there will be a substantial shortage of elders unless we address it quickly. Uh, with church growth, that shortage will get even worse. The recruitment of effective clergy is critical, and strategies must be deployed. That's really where I'm ending, but now let me fill in the, big, the, the middle part. Uh, you've, you've known about the decline. I want to draw you a little bit sharper picture of it. And this may be a little disturbing, but it should be. Membership in the United Methodist Church in the United States is a percent of the U.S. population. If we go all the way back to 1850, uh, Methodists, our predecessor denomination, represented between nine, eight and nine percent of the population. And it remained there for long periods of time. And up until about 1960, it remained right in that range. But starting in the 1960s, the wheels fell off. And you can see the substantial decline all the way down below 4%. The conventional wisdom is this. Membership, a statistic, is evidence of the past. Worship attendance is evidence of what's going on today. And professions of faith is evidence of the future, a good predictor of where we will be in the future. The percentage changes in those uh, three variables from 2002 to 2011. Worship attendance, I have trouble reading it from here. What is that? Uh, four. Eight point what? <laughs> eight point eight percent decline in in uh, membership. Attendance is uh, thirteen point four percent. And professions of faith, which is our predictor of the future, is twenty seven point eight nine percent. Twenty seven point nine percent. If you knew nothing else, you would say we are going downhill fast. It gets worse. 
the disassembly of the infrastructure. As an economist, we can look at the infrastructure of our denomination and say this is how everything is held together. We call it a connection. If we look at the period 1990 to 2011, worship attendance dropped 12.8% over that period of time. The number of churches dropped 13.7%, which is faster than the drop in worship attendance. The number of districts dropped 16.1%, and the number of annual conferences dropped 18.1%. We're disassembling our infrastructure faster than the drop in worship attendance. There's a consequence to that. If we look at some of our regression results, and I don't want you to have to memorize this, but I'll just tell you what the story says. It gives us evidence that when, you, when an annual conference reduces the number of districts, it actually promotes further decline. The reduction in the number of districts in an annual conference is almost always for the purpose of reducing the pressures on the annual conference budget. But in fact, the consequence is even faster decline in worship attendance, professions of faith, and a deterioration in the payment of apportionments. And the disassembly of districts, as you saw, you saw was it much faster than the decline in worship attendance. Now, what does all of this mean? It means that we're going downhill fast. And if you look at those statistics alone, the rate of decline is going to get faster, going to get faster. Several years ago, uh, I talked to GCFNA about the possibility of building a national model that I thought it was important for all of us to kind of see the future portraits of the denomination. That is, what are we going to look like, say, in 2030? Uh, we can talk about it, but maybe there's a better methodological way of drawing that portrait. Uh, as an economist, we build economic models, and we build them based upon past experience. We're trained to do that. The Economic Advisory Committee is using the national model in the projections of payouts uh, and funding of the general church, and also the rate of decline in worship attendance uh, and membership. That model was established in 2008. It took a year to build it. It uh, develops the general conference budget and recommend recommendations to GCFA and the connectional table. That is, that's one of the purposes of the uh, Economic Advisory Committee. Uh, the construction of the model was, uh, was completed in 2012. Uh, and now let me tell you a little bit about what is its basis. Uh, to be able to predict the future, we need to identify the causes of change. And that's what modeling, economic modeling, is all about. We're rich with data. And in fact, in the development of the national model, we used 750,000 local church reports. We looked at 32,000 churches over a period of 22 years. That's very rich data. Uh, from that, we can see patterns of growth and patterns of decline and try to explain them. We looked at the demographic changes surrounding the churches. We understand or had the understanding before we started looking at the data that some of the drivers of worship attendance you know, are the changes in the neighborhood of the local churches. Uh, so in this work, we identified the location of every local church in the United States, United Methodist, and drew a circle around them, three miles, and counted the number of people uh, that are of the same race and ethnic composition as the congregation. We call that an affinity population. Uh, we did that, take into account demographic changes that also drive worship attendance. We looked at the clergy records. We wanted to know who was appointed to those churches, and we wanted to know how long that pastor had been in that appointment. We wanted to know the gender and age of that pastor. Uh, so basically what, we, what we're looking at are uh, the drivers of worship attendance. In the, United, in the local United Methodist Church. There were three major drivers that we can observe. There are others that we can't. Uh, but these major drivers are these, and you know them. The senior pastor, 
makes a huge difference. The population surrounding the local church makes a difference. And what we discovered was the spending patterns of the local church also makes a difference. But to look at the growth and decline of local churches and of districts and of annual conferences, we also had to take into account new church starts. We had to look at the spending patterns, and from that we built a model. And what we do with that model is, again, draw a portrait of where the denomination is going to be in the future on the basis of various assumptions. And I'll tell you essentially what those assumptions are. We can look within an annual conference and look at the propensity of growing new churches. So for every conference, we measure that. How many new churches per year or per five-year period an annual conference has established? And in the projections in the future, we did seven different projections, but in some of them, we'll repeat exactly that propensity into the future. Uh, we look at church closures. We estimate church closures on the basis of attendance. When attendance gets down to a certain level, uh, we automatically close it, we just, in the future. But it's based in part upon the attendance and giving patterns. Uh, some churches are small but can stay in operation if the giving is pretty large. Uh, but if the giving is not very large, then they will close sooner. So we're closing churches in the projection as well, as well as establishing new church starts. The projected decline. If we look at our history just from a period of about 1974 out to 2010, now we can go out to 2011, but the pattern is the same. Why don't you look at what happened in 2002? The decline in worship attendance in 2002 is marked and it's persistent. We're losing 52,000 worship attendees per year from 2002, and I want you to look at how straight that line is starting in 2002. It seems to be a persistent decline that has been uninterrupted, uninterrupted, even though there have been many different attempts to try to change it. If we take that projection, if we take that projection and extend it on, the bad news hits by the year 2020, I'm sorry, 2050, the denomination is disassembled. In fact, it probably will be sooner than that. The United Methodist Church as we know it and its connection in the United States is gone. We do not have the funds to support the connection. We will have no districts, no annual conferences, no bishops, no general church, no agencies, no committees. All of it's gone around the year 2020 if the rate of decline continues at 52,000 per year. That's in about 37 years. About 37 years, we would predict it's toast. Well, when you look at that, it's, it's disturbing. And it's also it, it, it also causes some anger, I think. Anger in the sense that we've seen this decline since the 1960s. And we've been working on it since the 1960s. Nothing has worked in terms of preventing this decline. And we ask ourselves, is there anything in our toolbox? Anything in our toolbox with which we can apply and deploy a strategy and turn this around? And that was really the quest is there anything on the basis of what we know, what we understand, that we can develop a strategy in which we can arrest the decline and turn us into a growing denomination in the United States? I believe we can. Well, <laughs> I would show you more, but click, 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 it's not happening. Okay, there we go, there we go. All right, what we're calling this is a benchmark strategy, and that's what I want to teach you now, is the benchmark strategy of what is being un unveiled uh, as uh, our attempt to try to arrest the decline. 
It's made up of benchmark projects. These are local churches that participate uh, in a project and in so doing will grow. It's based upon district reports. The district reports largely are helping districts identify potential participants in benchmark projects. Same thing, and bishops' conclaves, this is something that has been established in the South Central jurisdiction where active bishops get together two days, uh, twice a year, uh, in private conversation, away from all of the influences of their offices. And they can share information, they can garner some support among themselves. Annual conference reports, uh, that is giving some projections of where the annual conference is going to be in the future. Uh, just as we have the national projection model, we can break that into the annual conference models and demonstrate where an annual conference is going to be by the year 2030. And then annual conference repositories, that's assembling the data together to where the, the uh, cabinet uh, can better evaluate the history of pastors and the history of churches in appointment making. Those are the components of the uh, benchmark, oh, and the jurisdictional reports as well. Uh, those are the components of the strategy. How do they work together? They all work together like this. They're all trying to improve and increase the number of participating churches in the benchmark project. The benchmark project is where the rubber hits the road. It is where everything happens and all the other parts of the strategy is feeding into that. Now, what is the benchmark project? The key features, we go into a local church based upon our research and identify what we call investment opportunities. That is, we look at growing churches and looking at how they spend their money, and then we compare it with a participating church to see if, in fact, we find a spending deficiency. And we do it in only two categories. We do it in programs, and we do it in non-clergy staff, because our research shows that investments or expansions in those two spending categories promote growth in worship attendance. So we look at growing churches, we look at how much they spend their money uh, in those two categories, we compare it with a participating church and see if in fact there's a deficiency. Well, we're, we're stuck once more. Maybe I should click faster. There it goes. The other part of the project is this, and this is a, a real key part. If in, we find a participating church and there is a spending deficiency, they will go raise the money off budget to repair that deficiency. They don't use the budget and realign it, but they, they go out and raise new money to invest in local church growth, spending it in those two uh, either of those two or both of those spinning categories. I'm still stuck. There we go. The spinning has to be for the sole purpose of growth. That's the condition of the program. And the anticip anticipated result is church growth. Now let's look at some findings. We're stuck again. Ready? Okay. <laughs> here, is the, here are the econometrics behind it. This is where we gain our confidence. I'll, uh, I'm not going to teach you econometrics, but I want you to look at the Z value over there, the, cur the, the schedule of numbers on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, as a statistician, we have confidence in any of those coefficients, which is the middle column. If any of those numbers are greater than 1.645, uh, you can see that all of them are greater than 6. 4, 6. Uh, 1.645, and I want you to pay attention to the one called, the variable called program. The program and the coefficient there, the coefficient is 0 0.0014946. That is telling us that if a local church increases expenditures and programs, there will be a commensurate increase in worship attendance, all else being constant. Likewise, if you look at staff, and that's non-clergy staff, with an increase in expenditures in non-clergy staff, there will be an increase in worship attendance, all else being equal. 
I want you to note at the bottom age. The coefficient is negative, which says when the age of the senior pastor is younger, all else being equal, there will be faster growth. So those are the things I want you to take away from this. Programs, staff, and age. Okay? Because we're going to come, come back to that. Uh, I want you to see how it works. We look at a church. This one is my local church. We have three churches in a pilot right now. Our church is one of them. What we do in this, and let's see if yeah, it works. We look at the growing churches in a category of churches of the same size and with the same affinity population pattern in the neighborhood and no change in senior pastor. And we measure how much they spend among the growing churches. In this one, this category, it's $74.42 per attendee. That's our benchmark. It is $281.06 per attendee for non-clergy staff expenditures. So growing churches in that category spend their money in this way. Then we look at how, how we actually spent our money over, on average over the last five years. For our church, it was $69.01 for programs. It was $248.41 for non-clergy staff. So we can measure the deficiency. $5.41 for programs per attendee, $32.65 for non-clergy staff. And if we multiply times attendance, we get a total deficiency for programs of $9,561 and $57,722. That is what we measured as our deficiency. Now, what is the impact? Now that, remember that table with the coefficients? We can go back and use those again. If, in fact, we repair these deficiencies, we can predict what the gain in worship attendance will be. For our church, if we spend $9,561 more in programs per year, we will increase worship, worship attendance by eight. Likewise, if we spend an extra $57,722 on non-clergy staff, we will get a gain in worship attendance of 39. If we do both, and our total is $67,000, we should see an increase in worship attendance of 48, which in our congregation is 6.24%. That's really the magic of it. You measure a deficiency, you collect the money off budget, you spend it, and now you have a prediction of about how much you're going to grow. Then you compare your growth with what was predicted. It is really that simple. Now, how does it work in terms of a, an investment from outside? And year one, we measure all, we, we raise all the money off budget. So you have some generous donors in our church to come up with $67,000. We got 68,000. And they commit to two years they're going to deploy $68,000 in year one and $68,000 in year two to the extent that it's needed. But what we predict is this. We're going to predict growth in the budget because of the impact on worship attendance, and we can calculate a prediction of that as well. So in the end, the growth in worship attendance is going to increase the budget such that, and if you can get your finance committee to agree with this, the growth in the budget is going to prioritize to the point that you replace the donors. So the donors come up with $67,000, that's the red part in year one. In year two, with some growth of the budget, you replace them. They don't have to come up with 67000 It's some amount less than that, the amount of which you don't know yet. And by year three, they're gone. And what you've done is you've identified a way in which you can grow the church and you've put it in as part of the budget and it stays in the budget forever. So for the first time, perhaps, in many churches, you have a dedicated part of the budget for the purpose of growth. All of you probably have been on finance committees before, and you know the struggles in finance committee when there's an increase in the budget and you decide how to spend it. A person saying, gee, let's grow the church is usually not part of the conversation. This one makes it the part of the conversation. So what we're doing is we're getting a pile of money and putting it on the table in front of the finance committee. 
and we're saying here's money that comes off budget. It's not, you're not cutting anything else out of the budget. And it's important for that because you don't want anything else cut. And you're saying spend this money for growth. So they start discerning and figuring out we've never had this before. So they start deciding how are they going to spend the money for the sole purpose of growth. We've had three to do it, and they all three came up with different answers. And it probably will because every church is different. Their staff is different. Their pastor is different. The community that they minister to is different. So everyone, every local church probably will come up with a different solution. But all three came up with their solutions and deployed those monies for the purpose of growth. And there was no competition for the money. You didn't have to share it with any other ministry or mission. It was for the purpose of growth. And if it's incorporated into the budget, the growth pattern of those participating churches will change forever as long as they protect that part of the budget. Now, how did we come out with it? This all started in the West District of the, of the Texas Annual Conference. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be a member of that uh, district leadership team. Uh, and this is how it all really came about. We looked at our decline in worship attendance in our district, and we said, what can we do to arrest it? And we came up with the deployment of the benchmark project, and we decided if we had 148 gain in worship attendance, we would not only arrest the decline in our district, we would actually grow the district. And then we discovered it would take only three churches to do it. So we went to those senior pastors of those three churches and invited them to participate in the program. They all did. And now they're doing it. And if you can look, the gains in each of those, they sum up to the 148, and that, as a strategy of the district, is going to turn the district from a declining district into a growing district. That was the whole purpose, the whole purpose. National strategy, we can do that not only for a district, we can do it for the nation as a whole. If, in fact, we are declining by 52,000 per year, we now know what we have to gain to be able to reverse that trend. And in fact, to turn us into a growing denomination, we estimate we need about 62,600 growth in worship attendance as a result of the benchmark projects. And it will take 998 churches to do it, spread throughout the annual conferences, and it's going to take an investment of about $120 million. So if, in fact, we can get 998 churches to assemble $120 million in new money and spend it for the sole purpose of growth, we will arrest the decline. We will arrest the decline. That's how it works. The progress so far. One of the metrics is raising the funds. We're doing it in our, our district to see uh, how well that part of the strategy is going and also reaching the targeted gain in worship attendance. Uh, what we're doing so far is this. Huntsville needed to raise 41,600. They raised 29,832. They, they did not raise enough, but they did enough to deploy their strategy. A&M Methodist, we needed 68,000, we got 68,000. Christ needed 83,000, they raised 98,000. So among the three pilot churches we have on the ground thus far, they raised 101.7% of what was targeted. That was an important step. So that's a positive result, and it's too early yet to see whether we're going to gain in the worship attendance that we projected. It takes three years to get there. <clears throat> but those results for us are promising. How, does it, how did it expand? We started in the West District. We're going to the Texas conferences to start deploying participating churches, then the South Central jurisdiction, and then all the annual conferences. That is the plan of how it will be deployed. This is basically what we calculated we needed. 200 churches in the South Central jurisdiction, 376 churches in the Southeast, 144 in the Northeast, 198 in North Central, and 80 in the West. Total of 998. And if they're deployed and we get the fruit out of those investments, $120 million investment, we will reverse the decline. $120 million in over 10 years, 998 strategic churches, a 
program gain of 62,600 in additional attendees by 2024, but the bottom is hit in 2021. This is how it's supposed to look. By 2021, we're at the bottom. By 2024, we're growing. We will not go away. Now, other critical parts of the puzzle. This is where you come in. In terms of ex fulfilling these expectations, we did not take into account a shortage of elders. We assume that new church starts will continue at the rate that they, we have seen historically within the annual conferences. So new church starts have to continue. Church revitalization should continue. We're going to touch 998 churches. There are 32,000 of them. So revitalization of churches must continue, and it must work. Downsizing efficiencies, we're getting good at that. That's a sad story. It means that we know how to decline. We know how to close districts. We know how to close annual conferences. We know how to close churches. And we're getting skilled at that. That's a sad, sad story that our honed skills are how do we manage decline. We also need missional efficiencies. As we decline and as the money starts getting thinner and thinner, what mission activities do we keep? And what mission activities do we give away? But they're going to be different if we believe we're turning it around. Because there will some, be some that you want to save for the turnaround. If you don't believe there's a turnaround, you do a different path. But if you believe there's a turnaround, you change the path that you take in decline. Because by 2021, the decline's over. Now, let's look at, I'm going to teach you a little bit of, of, uh, of economics here. And it, I, I, I wouldn't do it if it weren't important. The surplus of elders that you've heard in some annual conferences going away, if it hasn't already. I want to look, look at the projections of two things, and this is how we identify the, not only the existence of a shortage, but the magnitude of the shortage. We want to look at elder positions in the local church, that is, of the local church that have their budgets, how many, how many positions are available for elders? And there's a certain wage scale or a salary scale for those, and we measure that. It, it differs by annual conference, uh, but we measure that based upon historical evidence. And also the number of elders seeking positions in the local church. Those two things are important. When we look at the number of elders seeking local church appointments, that is the projection out to 2030. Why don't you look at that block? The decline in the number of elders seeking positions in the local churches is going to decline rapidly through the year 2020 because of the baby boom. People like me, they're reaching retirement age. There are many of us. And our retirements begin now and will continue heavily through the year 2020. That's really what is driving the drop in the number of elders seeking positions in local churches. Now let's look at the number of uh, elder positions in the local church. This is a cause, the decline there is driven by decline in worship attendance. That really is the major driver. We're closing churches as well, but when you close a church, generally there's not an elder there. The elder is gone before you ever get to the point of 20 in, in worship attendance or 12 or five in worship attendance. You've already lost the elder long ago. But what's the driver is worship attendance. Now, if we put those two together, this is what it looks like. The decline in the number of elder positions in the local church is not dropping as fast as retirements, which means that by the year 2020, if these projections hold true, we're going to be short nationally of 4,143 elders. 4,143 elders. By 2030, it's 5,041. 
Elder Short. Now, in our projection of the turnaround, we've assumed that that will be attended to. That is, the seminaries are going to be graduating more and more to fill these slots to erase the shortage. But the shortage is developing quickly, and it, the amount, the magnitude, is going to be re relatively large very soon. The projected number of elders, let me show you what we assumed would happen. We assumed that we were going to have 339 new elders per year seeking a position in the local church. If you look historically, this is the pattern. We're down to 150. So even our projection, in which we're going to have over 4,000 short in 2020, even that projection is assuming a production rate that is faster than what we have seen historically. So not only do the numbers have to increase much larger than what they have been just to make the projection accurate, we have to also erase the 4,000 shortage by the year 2020. There was a memorable meeting. We, we uh, on our Committee on Episcopacy in the jurisdiction, we have these interviews with bishops. Uh, and uh, over the last uh, at least two quadrenniums, those interviews have been very, very fruitful. We take them one at a time, so they don't know what each other, each other has said uh, among the others. We bring them in, they can't hear the others. And we spend about an hour with them. And, okay, and every quadrennium, when we do this, there will be some that are retiring. The retiring bishops are very, very open. And they will share things with you that you haven't always heard from the active bishops. I will say about our college, even the active bishops were saying the same thing. They have courage. Uh, but I want you to read a summary of what one of them said. The question was this. What were the major mistakes made as a United Methodist denomination that contributed to the downturn in membership beginning in the 1960s? What mistakes were made? Here is essentially the answer from a retiring bishop. We need the best, the brightest and best to enter the ranks of the clergy. We have not been recruiting the brightest and best, and our performance demonstrates that fact. We cannot expect great things from our clergy. Many of our present clergy were drawn from the middle and bottom of their classes. We do not have sufficient numbers of talented clergy. God is calling talented leaders into the Christian church, but they are not choosing United Methodism. Ouch. Indeed, there are. But what the bishop is saying is the talent pool contains some exceptional leaders, but the pool itself is fairly shallow. Which means that if we're going to meet the challenges in the future, we've got to start recruiting the best and the brightest, and our past practices will not do it. Now let me teach you a little bit of economics. Career choice is affected by career earnings. This is an economic principle. I hope it doesn't apply to the clergy, but if it does, I want to tell you basically where we're sitting. I did, I, I've done some work for the American Dental Association. I used to be on their staff, and I've continued that work for 30 years. One of the things that I was doing was looking at the number, predicted number of new dentists coming into the profession. And part of the driver of the number of new dentists coming into the profession are the number of applicants to dental school. All right, do you see the parallel? This is called a, the rate of return to dentistry. The way it works is this. You look at the age earning cycle of dentists, you look at their educational expenses, and you take the, what we call the present value of that and compare it to the present value of earnings of the average college grad that is not, does not go to graduate school. Then you calculate the rate of return that would make people indifferent between finishing undergraduate school and going into a career 
or going to dental school and having the career earnings of a dentist. You can see over time, this rate of return to dentistry has gone through cycles. All right, that's just calculating the actuals, comparing dentist earnings and the cost of education with the earnings of an average college grad that does not go to graduate school. To look at this, this is trying to predict the applicant rate to dental school. That is the percent of college grads that apply to dental school. The percent of college grads that apply to dental school. These are the actuals, the red one. And then we built a model to try to predict it. The green is what we predicted. I want you to note the cycles, deep cycles. The number of applicants to dental school dramatically changed over that period of time. At one time, it was about three applicants per seat, and it dropped very close to one applicant per seat. And the driver of that was the rate of return to dentistry, which is governed by two things. It's governed by the cost of education and governed by earnings as a career in dentistry. And when the rate of return improves, the applicant rate goes up. When the rate of return falls, the applicant rate falls. We've had dramatic swings in the number of dentists coming out of dental school, all the way from 5,000 going down to less than 3,000 as a result of changes in the number of applicants to dental school. So that's the fundamental principle. Now you understand that. I hope it doesn't work for clergy. Let me look at, the, look at the age earning cycles of the average college grad, which is the blue, and elders, which is red. Hmm. The rate of return to education to become a clergy in the United Methodist Church is not that swift. So when you look at the best and brightest, and you're trying to recruit the best and brightest into your denomination, how well are you going to do with this calculated rate of return and the educational debt that they come out with? Now you can improve the rate of return by reducing educational debt because that's up front. It has a big impact. Scholarships have a big impact. But nevertheless, that's what we're facing. We would say we have a critical shortage of applicants to go to seminary. And if in fact we're going to fill that shortage of elders, the 4,000, we have to increase the number of applicants. Student debt is one of our challenges. Extended years of low earnings is another challenge. Entrepreneurs unrewarded is a challenge and declining denomination is a challenge. Why would you choose the United Methodist Church? If in fact you think the connection is gone by 2050. Sobering. Why an emphasis on young clergy? You've heard that. There are two reasons that I come up with. There are more. Remember that equation that I showed you and the age effect? Younger clergy yield faster growth compared to older clergy. So if you want to grow the church, the younger clergy are more productive. That's an economic term. The other is, if you look at, and this was just a simulation, if you have only so much in scholarships to spend, if you re recruit new clergy that are only going to give you 10 years of work, you've got to get new applicants and spend the money on education every 10 years to replace them. But if, in fact, they have a 30-year career, you only do it one time for 30 years. So it becomes very easy to see that if, in fact, you have a fixed amount of scholarship money, you get more bang for the buck for the younger clergy because you don't have to spend those 
scholarship dollars as frequently. Now, in conclusion, what have I said? The United Methodist Church is in peril. In fact, our projections say in 2050 we're toast. That's in 37 years. We have a benchmark strategy that is already deployed, and it has some promise. We believe it will do it. The strategy predicts a turnaround by 2021. But the strategy depends on other key components. It depends on no shortage of elders. No shortage of elders is necessary for this to work. Church, new church starts must continue at least at the pace that we've seen historically. Church revitalization programs must continue. Well-managed decline to 2021 and well-managed mission. What will eliminate the shortage of elders? Substantial growth in the applicant pool. How do we do that? We can be helped immensely by the work of the local church in looking at these young people that might have an interest in a call. We used to do it well. We don't do it that well. I had a meeting with Bill Lawrence at Perkins and asked him, what is the challenge for y'all? Getting applicants to Perkins in every other seminary. And that is dependent upon the call in the local church. Dependent upon the call of the local church. Emphasis on young and talented clergy. Improving the earnings of elders. Efficient use of the scholarships and the promise of a turnaround. If in fact you believe there is going to be a turnaround, and I do, think of the difference that does in the, in the minds of a young, talented student trying to decide what career path to take. If in fact they're convinced that the United Methodist Church is going to grow and that that young clergy is going to be a part of that growth, that's challenging and inspiring. If, on the other hand, we don't have any plans in place, and the prediction is the denomination is going away in 2050, and there's nothing that young clergy can do about it, that's not very appetizing. So I think the potential turnaround can help in the recruitment as well. Few mistakes. We've made many mistakes in the past. We can't afford very many more. That means we have to do things well. We have to look and maybe change what we've done and change them quickly. And we have to be strategic in our decision. That's it. I appreciate your attention and time.